name is Tony Troop. I'm the, here at Jane Doe and uh, you, she, and her pronouns. I'm delighted, delighted to be welcoming you all to our second Real Talk event. Um, when we were brainstorming at the development committee about what we could be doing to help engage and and, and really um, involve our donors and supporters and the work that we have the privilege of doing every single day. Um, we came up with this idea of, you know, um, inviting you all to be part of the conversation with us. And I'm just delighted um, to be here with all of you. I will um, take a moment and ask each of you um, to also think about the land that we you are currently sitting in, standing on, living in, working from, um, because as we know, um, throughout this country, um, we are all on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the native peoples um, of this country. And, um, you know, the, whether you're here in Massachusetts, a name that had been appropriated from the Massachusetts people, or wherever um, you sit, you know, we take this time to acknowledge the past and the present violence that's been inflicted upon native peoples and their native lands in the name of this country. We make a commitment to deepening our understanding of that truth. And as a coalition here, because that's who we are, to building authentic relationships with native peoples here in, in, um, in our communities um, who are leading the work to end domestic and sexual violence in their own native communities. So please take a moment to just acknowledge that, think about it, learn about it. If it's this whole idea of a land acknowledgement is new to you, we invite you to learn about it and to think about what that process and that experience means um, mean, can mean for you and the people in your lives. So the other piece we would ask is, because um, we do want to be here in community, uh, many of you have your names already on your screens with your Zoom. Some of you have nicknames, but, um, or one name. Um, but drop a note in the chat um, with your affiliation too, so that people can get a sense of who's here um, and why we're here together, because um, this is what it's about. So thank you. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn this over to our um, tremendous panel tonight um, with, okay, you're, I'm gonna start with <laughs> Debbie Hall, and then, um, cause we were talking about the Debbies and the Deborahs and the Debs who are all here with us tonight. So I'm gonna start with Debbie Hall, um, who is the CEO of the YWCA in Central Mass and also a member of the board of directors of Jane Doe. Um, we're just delighted to have you be part of this evening's conversation. Um, Deborah Robin, the executive director of Jane Doe and Sonia Chang Diaz, my state senator, um, but also just uh, somebody who has represented us all so well um, in the state senate in the Commonwealth. So thank you all for being here. And Debbie, I pass it on to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tony, for that introduction, land acknowledgement. I am so happy to see so many of the board members of Jane Doe Inc. on this call tonight. So welcome. Thank you for joining us and your continued support as we continue as a board to go through strategic planning um, and, and do some really hard work. And, and um, this is of course, second in a series um, that we are calling Real Talk as Tony explained. I also wanna note that it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And as Deborah Robin reminded me, it is the 37th year of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, so I wanna keep that in mind and also the fifth anniversary of the Me Too movement. We got a lot of things to talk about. Um, tonight, uh, we're, this is going to be conversational. You know, we're going to be just talking, uh, maybe from our living rooms. I want all of you all to feel comfortable enough, um, to just enjoy the conversation that I am sure is going to be robust. Um, at the same time, I want folks in the audience, please send in questions as you hear things or things come up for you or, or, or some point of discussion is of interest. Um, please drop that in the chat. Tony will be monitoring the chat and we will get to those questions. So feel free if something uh, comes up that you want to talk about, we definitely want to uh, engage in that way. Um, tonight's theme will focus on access. Um, and it should be pretty interesting. Uh, as Tony introduced our, our speakers, Deborah Robin, who is our visionary leader at Jane Doe Inc. And of course, Senator Diaz, uh, who has uh, 
done quite a few things. She's been a leading proponent of equitable, high quality education. She has helped pass reforms to the state's quarry and criminal justice systems, curtail the misuse of special education dollars, and has been instrumental in the passage of civil rights protections for uh, transgender by Bay Staters. I'm sorry. Um, so we know you have a lot to say uh, tonight. So let's get started. Um, and let's start with you, Senator uh, Diaz. When you heard that tonight was a chance for some real talk, what are you most excited about exploring with us this evening? You're on mute. You're on mute. That's okay. I'm, I'm, still, doing, I'm day still day. doing that. I'm, I'm still day. doing that. <laughs> um, gives me a minute to gather my thoughts. You know, I think, honestly, the thing that probably first and most uh, you know, it gets me excited when I hear, you know, the billing real talk is just honestly being in community with people who crave that, you know, uh, uh, and who come for that. Um, I find in, in my profession um, that there are folks really at both ends of the spectrum in their desire for real talk. Um, and, you know, I have to every day sort of, you know, navigate in those worlds. And, um, you know, being in a room, uh, uh, physical or virtual, with folks who, um, who pull up their chair saying, yes, please, let's make this some real talk, um, is just a delight. And, um, uh, uh, you know, it's liberating. Um, I try to make it my business to, you know, bring the ethos of real talk to, um, to the Senate chamber, uh, you know, to the platforms that I, you know, the social media platforms and communication platforms that I have and to the legislature as a whole um, and to Massachusetts politics in a bigger way. Um, but, you know, in the spirit of real talk, I'll say that I think we all uh, know that um, we don't always have that luxury. Uh, and when I say we, I mean, um, marginalized people of all stripes. Um, don't always have the luxury of, um, you know, engaging in, in unreserved real talk all the time um, and have to, uh, you know, choo pick and choose our moments um, in service of the people that we represent and that we're here to um, do service for and change the lives of and work in collaboration with. And so I say it is liberating, you know, to be in a room where people say, yes, please, you know, speak your mind. Wonderful. And Deborah, how about you? I really appreciate that, um, Senator. But I also think on uh, two ways, um, part of what holds us back is not having real talk in terms of making change. And in particular, the issues that JDI works on, domestic violence and sexual assault, those are issues that have been shrouded in silence, that are not being talked about, that are often minimized and marginalized and even more marginalized in those communities that don't have access or face so many barriers. So I see that that it's sort of like walking the walk or talking the talk that we're going to engage in conversation as a way to open up change um, and also set an example that it's okay to talk about these things. Thank you, Deborah. And I, um, it, Senator Chang Diaz, as you were talking about, it, it, there are sometimes I feel times and places where um, we always need to engage in real talk when we're talking about survivors and marginalized community. But are there certain spaces where we temper what we say in order to be heard in a certain way? Um, and that I uh, sometimes struggle with. Where are those places? And how do you um, hold yourself? How are you honest and true to yourself and your values when you do that? But that is something we navigate every day, I think, in, in certain spaces and as certain identities we claim. Um, so I want to jump into, um, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It is the 37th year. I remember beginning this work uh, a long time ago, over 30 years ago. And... Um, in some way disillusioned to see how far we come or how far we haven't come. Um, what are some, Deborah, maybe I'll, I'll give this to you first. What are some things, what are the needs you see in terms of how we should approach or continue to approach uh, this month in particular and how we talk about 
uh, domestic violence and, and sexual violence even. How are we, what do we need to do? Is there more we need to do? Um, you know, in some ways I've been doing a lot of speaking in particular this week about this, these issues. And in some settings, folks in different communities still want to talk about some of the really fundamental basic information about domestic violence. What is it? How does it impact people differently? Not seeing it just as a physical manifestation, but emotional, psychological, financial, all the different ways that power and control shows up. Um, but more broadly, I think we really have to see where are we at in this moment? Where has change happened and where has it been slow? Sadly, I, I was disillusioned, I think, too. You know, um, I think in a lot of ways, we haven't changed the needle a lot, uh, as much as we hoped, for sure. And yet, I just want to say, every day across the world, survivors are thriving. So I think that's important to acknowledge. But I think when we think about inter intersectional identities and we think about systems, we that is where we have, that is the moment we are at where we are in and have been for a while. I think the movement as a whole, particularly across the country, is thinking a lot about how we frame domestic violence. It has been framed so much as a crime and many of us are rejecting that depiction, not to say that it doesn't have the criminal legal implications, but that is a narrow frame. It is a social justice issue and an issue of access. And we know that many survivors are not seeking services because the services that they need and deserve are not available to them. We have, I don't, I'm not talking about emergency shelter because the issue with not having enough shelter beds is because we have a housing crisis that impacts uh, survivors and those who are unhoused. We don't have equitable access to other services such as mental health services that are trauma informed. But we also um, have over relied on a punitive carceral system that we're starting to really think about where does criminal justice reform and anti-violence work intersect? And where are the opportunities to think differently about that? And what do we do about people who cause harm? Um, we used to have a very binary approach to that, I think. And, and now we're, we don't have the answers entirely, but we are really asking those questions. And, and the last thing, which we'll, I know we'll touch on, particularly around the education realm, is where is the world of prevention and how do we push that forward? Because we have to be, we're taking a stand against something, but we also have to have a vision of what we stand for. And that vision is based on the kind of peace and safety and respectful relationships that we want to support across the board. And what does it take to get us to that vision? You know, what in our society contributes to the, the growing of people who cause harm in this way? And what are we gonna to do to change those conditions? Just a few things. Just, just a few things, simple <laughs> things, right? <laughs> you bring up so many um, great points and, and you know, part of this movement, uh, one of the things, as you said, most recently we have looked at, in the beginning we thought the answer was, as we were trying to partner with people and keep survivors safe, that the answer was you know, having partnerships with police departments and, and law enforcement. And this was the answer to keeping people safe for some of us. Um, but as things have evolved in different communities, um, um, have uh, had more of a voice, um, the police are not the first people we call because sometimes that can do more harm than good. Most times I would say that. And this is a nice segue, uh, Senator Chang Diaz. I know you've been doing a lot of work around police reform uh, and have been instrumental in that in our, our, our state. Um, and particularly as it affects brown and black communities and other marginalized communities, really LGBTQIA plus communities, trans. Um, so um, can you speak a little bit about the work you've done in that area and the connection you see um, and, and maybe some insight into uh, some other solutions? Sure. Well, I certainly don't want to claim to have uh, even, you know, a lot of the solutions, right? I'm in, in all honesty, um, 
you know, I, I come to this work as an ally and a, and a listener and a, you know, I try to be a sort of internal tip of the spear for, um, uh, internal to the state house, you know, tip of the spear for, um, for JDI, but um, take my marching orders from you, you know? So um, I do want to just start off by saying, um, and I hope this doesn't sound too corny, but, you know, a real salute and gratitude to the work of JDI for the reframing work that I see you doing. And like, and you are right on the vanguard of it. It is, I, from my vantage point, I see it as a he heavy load, like society is a pretty early in the early curve, you know, in the early in the curve of, of like getting it, of getting this reframe. And I, I see the work that you're doing to just, you know, to, to open people's eyes, to change hearts and minds, to broaden the scope. Um, and it's so valuable and so needed and, and your, um, you know, your brand and your imprimatur is so work, uh, so important in that work. So, and, and I saw that in full, you know, vivid color uh, just a few months ago, you know, on, in, at the very end of legislative session, I see the nods, right? You guys, you know what I'm about to uh, talk about, which was the debate on the last night of formal session on July 31st in the legislature about um, this sort of, uh, meshing and this jumble of policy that, um, that the governor had sort of brought into um, being intertwined with one another that really shouldn't have been intertwined with one another, which is this issue of um, pretrial detention policy and um, so-called no cost phone calls um, and video calls for incarcerated people, you know, in order to be able to stay in touch with their families and their loved ones on the outside. And um, the, you know, governor's proposal really using um, uh, the no cost phone calls proposal as a, as a, as a lever is the nicest word that I can use uh, um, to uh, force the legislature to do something that they, that he wanted that they didn't want to do, um, which was expand uh, pretrial detention powers um, of law enforcement in our state. Um, and, uh, you know, the debate on this was so raw um, and uh, you know the way that um, domestic and sexual violence survivors were um, frankly real talk right being a sort of bandied about um, I will use the word pawns um, as, as sort of you know everyone was sort of working to claim uh, the mantle of being um, you know defenders and protectors of survivors um, and it, in many cases in, um, in the service of expanding pretrial detention policy. And I remember, you know, looking at the letter from JDI, right, who is our trusted statewide voice when it comes to doing the difficult work of coalition and, you know, gathering of input from lots of different corners, right? We know that the community of survivors are not monolithic, um, but doing that work to sort of create synthesis um, and be in coalition across a broad spectrum. Um, and, and voicing, you know, to the legislature that JDI was not in support of this, um, you know, of this package to expand pretrial detention. You were careful in your statement to say there are some expansions, right, that we support in a very targeted way. But this, you know, broad brush approach, we just can't stand behind. And, you know, standing up and reading that statement on the floor and still hearing so many of my colleagues say, I'm going to vote for this expansion of policing powers and, det and pretrial detention. Um, powers outside of, you know, due process um, in the name of uh, sexual and domestic uh, violence survivors. And it was just this clash, right, of, um, of frames uh, of how do we think of victims, right? Who counts as a victim? Um, who counts as a survivor? Um, who has suffered violence and who hasn't suffered? Do we, who do we not count as having suffered violence in our society? Um, and as many of you, you know, on the Zoom know, um, uh, I'll, what I'll say is we, right, the JDI position, my position uh, in that debate lost um, pretty significantly. Um, thankfully, the proposal did not end up um, going through and becoming law because um, we had some disagreement between the House and the Senate. Um, but it was a really vivid example for me of how much work we have yet to do um, in, in working people through that learning curve, right, of thinking of survivors um, who, who's a victim and who's a survivor and who counts in our vision, um, in our government and in our society.
Wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for your allyship, Senator Chang Diaz. Um, we know the importance of having people in, in different places and, and, and people who are representative of folks that live in the Commonwealth. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about access, as Deborah, you alluded to um, earlier in your remark, um, access to so many things as we kind of take on social justice um, and are more comprehensive in our approach at JDI and how we look at violence. Uh, and what it looks like in our society and violence looks like unlivable living conditions for people, right? We don't have affordable housing. It looks like access to voting, something as simple as that, um, to services, um, to a livable wage, which is not the livable wage we have now viable. <laughs> it's just not $15. It's just not helping anybody. Um, but uh, Deborah, I, I, you know, while we don't endorse uh, candidates uh, because of our status, we do take positions sometimes on certain issues. And one of those is a ballot issue uh, in the upcoming election, and that's uh, on the driver's license and residency. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, JDI's position on that, how you came to that? And really, as we're talking about access, keeping in mind survivors, how it impacts specifically uh, the folks that uh, whose voices we try to amplify every day at JDI. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, I was thinking to um, more recently about just the whole access topic. It it isn't about making changing a law necessarily. It isn't about passing something. It is really about transformation, which is why it's so hard to uh, attain. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not, it's not, I was, I was thinking like around reproductive health. Mm -hmm. Massachusetts is, is really forward and, you know, I'm proud of where our Commonwealth is, but there is an equitable access to reproductive health across the Commonwealth. And that then it is not, so not everyone really has the same access. And so we have to keep working on that. And that is about social change. That is asking communities to accept resources in their communities. Um, that's where we come up against resistance. And so I see the same thing with the, this ballot question. Um, and I'm glad that nonprofits can talk about ballot questions because it's an important position to consider. And we have been supporters of the Safe Communities Act for a very long time, which has not passed. And I see this as related to that. It's disheartening that there is so much misinformation about this ballot question um, because it, it just feeds on xenophobia. It feeds on um, all kinds of stereotypes and myths. And it makes good sense for public safety that people who are on the road are there because they have done the work that is needed in a bureaucracy, yes, but to have a driver's license. And it's almost hard to comprehend, although I do comprehend why that would not be popular, but it is, I also think it is using this issue as really a platform to fuel a lot of anti-immigrant sentiment. And that is a continued thread in the Commonwealth. Um, we have spoken and provided testimony every time Safe Communities comes up. So we can hear what people who oppose it say have to say about it. And if we're going to be this um, inclusive, welcoming state that we, you know, purport to be, then this is an air, this is an area of equity. No matter what you think about other issues related to immigration, and that's a whole other topic, there's no reason why we shouldn't want everyone to have the tools and resources to be a safe driver. Agreed. Senator Chang Diaz, any follow up to that? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, um, the analogs are many and, um, and I think help uh, bring this, the notion of access um, to um, anti-violence services to life. Um, the, uh, Reproductive health uh, is a is a you know is a really prime one. I thought of it right away too, and it's why I love so much that you know the movement is shifting to this you know verbiage of reproductive justice mm -hmm. um, rather than reproductive rights, right? Because um, as Deborah was saying, you know there's a right there's rights that exist on paper, 
Uh, and that's nice for you know policymakers. We can pat ourselves on the back and issue a press release and say we changed the law, you know. But if it does not, if it is not a living, breathing, uh, you know, reality that people have access to, it doesn't matter much. And you know, I think also of um, as I was thinking about access to uh, you know violence prevention intervention services, um, I was thinking about during the height of the pandemic. Uh, when we were in the midst of the sort of hunger games of the vaccine rollout uh, mm -hmm. in Massachusetts. And there was this, you know, real uh, learning curve, Frank, and I'm, you know, you might hear me invoke the governor a few times in this discussion, but that's what happens when you're the governor, right? You're in charge of stuff. Um, that, uh, you know, we saw the administration, and I think, I, I believe, right, that they believe this in good faith, where they said, like, basically, here's a bunch of vaccines in a pile over here, you know, and in Foxborough, access, right? Um, just come and get them and just get it, sign yourself up for an appointment. And, uh, you know, there was a limited supply, but there was this notion that, well, it's a lottery, right? So there's equitable access because everybody has, you know, a chance to sign up for those, um, for those limited number of appointments according to your, you know, risk level. But, uh, you know, I, I like, I said, look, this is not a lottery, it's a raffle. You know, and there's real equity differences between a lottery and a raffle. You know, in a raffle, your chances of getting the good thing go up every time you buy an extra ticket, right? And so, you know, do you have, you know, have you uh, had a lifetime without medical racism? You know, that's a ticket. Um, do you have access to a car? That's a ticket. Do you have a job or does your family members, you know, have a job where they can take time off to drive you to the appointment? That's a ticket. Do you speak English? That's a ticket. Can you spend four hours online, you know, refreshing until you get an appointment? Ticket, 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 right? And it's the same way um, with access to uh, violence intervention services, right? You need you, all of these, all of these privileges, uh, you know, um, get you access. And if you don't have those things, right, we may be able to pat ourselves on the back as a Commonwealth and say, we have nice laws in place um, against domestic and sexual violence. But if we are not checking ourselves and saying, are people actually getting through the front door uh, and getting protection? You know, it, it's, it's nice, it's a press release, but that's, it's not more than that. And are people getting to the front door in our specific communities? Mm -hmm. um, how are we providing services? right? That's about access also. How are we providing those services in a way in those underserved and sometimes overserved communities, um, mm -hmm. depending on how you look at it, how are we providing those services in a way that makes them want to uh, access them? Mm -hmm. That's huge too, right? Um, and so how we roll things out is important. And Deborah, as you said, I mean, we're really talking about something really foundational and transformational. And that is what scares people because it's not mm -hmm. just that one thing. A driver's like, yeah, but what does that mean for you? And, and then who has the right to something and who has um, access to things? And that becomes really important. And across also, our, go oh, ahead, yeah, yeah, Senator D. Chang Dias. Changing a law or increasing a penalty for something is inexpensive. Yep. Mm -hmm. Changing the systems yes. that give access it is not inexpensive, right? It, you know, it takes resources to have a transformation like that. And I think that is what we hit up against, you know, why it is politically difficult. Yeah. And we have to have real talk about that. That's real talk. That is real talk. So I'm thinking about this upcoming election in the Commonwealth, but also across our uh, country as we um, see a number of seats up, um, particularly in our Commonwealth, the, the governor's gonna change. Either way, the Lieutenant Governor it's going to be someone else, Secretary of State. We have a, a number of seats in the Senate and um, uh, the House um, that will change. I'm wondering, and as I, you know, we talk about just different candidates across the Commonwealth and people bringing up some issues that we're talking about tonight, carceral solutions to uh, certain things, and 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 the representation and the face of candidates, even in our Commonwealth, things are, are changing, um, even if it's slowly. I'm going to start with you, Senator Chang Diaz. What do you see as the most important issue facing the Commonwealth um, this year in this election? Well, um, I'm going to blend my answer with this to a caveat to the thing that I just said previously about what's expensive and you know what's not, which is, you know, generally speaking, I think that's that's a sort of a fair rule of thumb. 
But a nice break from that pattern is that granting people driver's licenses is not expensive. You know, it's a great way to increase access. Um, that is not a financial load for the state. It is, you know, um, it's an easy thing for us to do uh, logistically and cost-wise that is just, a, you know, it's a whole world of access opening up. And for all the, you know, uh, sort of members of the choir here, uh, you know, who, um, who say, yes, I want to support that. I just want to be put a real fine point on it because I know that a lot of people have confusion about question four, um, that which way is the good way, right, to vote because there's a lot of talk about overturning the legislature's, you know, law on this, the legislature's vote on this, that yes on four, is the way that we keep in place, you know, the, the law that the legislature has passed um, to grant driver's licenses um, to, you know, all drivers who pass a road test and, you know, have the paperwork. So yes, on four. Um, so other, uh, so I would put that high uh, on the sort of, you know, pantheon of most important issues on the ballot um, this fall in November, uh, you know, right up there with it. I'm gonna say um, question one, which is the fair share amendment, uh, AKA the millionaire's tax. Um, and, and I'm gonna connect a few dots here because I, and I think for many people, you know, investments, major structural investments in education and transportation infrastructure, which is what that money will go to, um, may feel a little, you know, a few steps removed um, from domestic and sexual violence. But of course, as we were just talking about with the driver's license, right? We know transportation actually is a pretty easy concept to understand that in a very literal way, uh, you know, our transportation infrastructure, particularly mass transit, public transportation, um, is a really important sort of vector, right, for access um, to services and not just services, but again, prevention, right? Because when we think about um, access to jobs, right, to economic power and independence, um, that that, you know, that transportation infrastructure is really vital as well. But on, on the education front, um, you know, I think of us going even further upstream when we think about prevention, um, that so, uh, so many, you know, some of you know, uh, before my life as a legislator, I was an educator. And, um, and for many of my years in the Senate, I chaired the Committee on Education. And what I hear over and over and over again from educators across this Commonwealth is that the, um, just the incredible rise, and this was even pre-pandemic, Right, the incredible rise in the amount of um, social emotional trauma and stress that young people are bringing in the doors of the school. Um, and of course that's a, you know, evidence of what's going on in their lives. It doesn't just sort of start at the school door and end at the school door. Um, and you know, we know that hurt people hurt people. And so if we wanna get better at prevention, right, we need to go far upstream and make sure that young people are getting those social emotional wraparound services where we, where we have them, right? Where we see them, where we know them. Um, and schools are, you know, the easiest intersection point um, to sort of see the early warning signs and start getting young people connected to services. I'm very gratified to report that um, the Student Opportunity Act, which was one of the, you know, bills that I worked, you know, it's like the lion's share of my time in the Senate getting that passed and it represents a major investment in our K through 12 schools, um, was passed in 2019 and we're starting to see the first, you know, millions of dollars roll out and almost to a T every educator and school leader and superintendent that I've talked to across the state when I ask them what are you spending your first SOA millions on they will say social emotional wraparound services and I would expect that that will be the same uh, with the money that is going to come from the fair share amendment right it won't be exclusively hopefully we're priming the pump with the SOA money but the fair share amendment money is going to you know we just know there is such a dearth of pediatric mental health services in this state um, and then again quality education um, is going to strengthen those um, systems of economic empowerment uh, for, you know, potential would-be victims and survivors in the future. So this is all groundwork um, that we can lay to, you know, reduce violence in the future. Thank you for that, Senator Chang Diaz. I want to remind our audience, if you have any of this is speaking to you, I see some comments in, in chat, um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in chat uh, so we can get your questions answered uh, if you want to join our conversation in that way. Um, that's wonderful. Um, I can tell you that I'm getting text messages every day, donate to this, and it's the millionaire's tax constantly um, and the driver's license issue. And they're just hot topics and the conversations I've heard around them. I think people don't have uh, a great understanding of them, um, but definitely um, get people uh, worked up for sure. Um, I'll just yes, throw one last one out there. I know, you know we're not supposed to 
you know, endorse specific candidates, but I will flag for um, folks around the state that there are some DAs races um, that are, uh, you know, competitive and, um, you know, have real stakes to them um, going on across the state and would encourage folks to check out DA's races in, in, you know, wherever you are in the state, or even might not be your home DA race, right, but look at the DA next door or across the state, because I can tell you as a state legislator, DA's have a lot of cachet in the state house when they come to comment on criminal legal policy uh, proposals and criminal legal reform proposals. Oftentimes DA's are um, you know, uh, the ones telling us slow down, don't change anything, you know, we like it how it is. Um, so uh, there's, there's real stakes if we want to ha hasten the, the, the pace of change on criminal justice reform uh, and some of the DA's races around the state. I agree and I, I think we don't uh, do enough or give enough information or, or people don't see how important certain races are, the sheriff of a town, that's an important race. Mm -hmm. Who the attorney general is, that's mm -hmm. important who the AD is, that's important. And so we look at the governor, lieutenant governor, but these are, are, are positions of power and they have a great deal of influence uh, on a state level. So uh, folks watching out, as you said, there's a, a number of folks running across the Commonwealth. Um, I encourage everybody to get educated. Uh, about it. And if you have friends in other towns, educate yourself around that. Deborah, I want to go to you now and, and just get your comment about what you see as uh, a, a priority um, in this election uh, cycle. You know, I, I really, um, in thinking about, there's individual candidates, but I was thinking about that when we think about the state budget, which is always a topic of conversation in the news, um, you know, the way we allocate resources, whether it's individually or collectively, is a reflection of our values and what matters. And there are a lot of competing um, needs for those things. And so we're fortunate in the Commonwealth that we have been able to uh, increase funding for domestic violence and sexual assault services. There are some states in the country that don't have any state funding. And we are over $60 million here and still not enough. But that's only one reflection of resources. And there are many other things that will have to be decided um, in the coming months and years about how we allocate resources. And so I am thinking about the impact of the prison moratorium, particularly on survivors who are incarcerated and what that is about and the amount of resources that re that 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 argument represents. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about housing, housing, the lack of affordable housing in the Commonwealth is such a barrier for survivors. It's, it's a national crisis. And here it, it, it is really impeding the ability of survivors and their families to thrive. I'm also thinking about something that I'm sure costs money is language access, equitable language access. English is not the first language for everyone, nor should it be, but we do not have systems and structures in place where local communities, state government can provide the support to individuals so that there can be more equitable language access. And, you know, the way that we also look at prevention, prevention is an investment in our future. In the, in the physical medical world, we talk about reducing heart disease and cancer rates and all of those things, but reducing uh, violence and thinking about the social determinants of health and the things that contribute to people not having well-being, food insecurity, housing insecurity. Those are things that if we invest in those things, we will have healthier communities and prevention will be more possible. Um, I just wanted to share every year in uh, the country, every state participates in something called the DV Counts Census. We just did that here uh, in the last couple of weeks and we pr pretty much have a, in like a 98 participation rate. And I just wanted to share that in the 2021 census, these are the the services that were requested on this one day on September 9th, 69% of programs provided services in bilingual advocacy. 56% provided support and advocacy related to housing and landlords. 
52% were around court accompaniment or legal advocacy. And it goes on and on. And these are all the kinds of barriers impacting that have a connection to who is in um, the state house, who are in all the elected officials and around the country, because we're also an inter interdependent you know, we're a global community actually or across the world. And so what happens in one place does affect us. Um, so I think there are many things that are on the ballot, whether we're talking about them or not or voting on them specifically, they are really about the values of what we wanna see as our priorities. Totally agree. Thank you for that, um, your thoughts. Um, and I see that Tony dropped in school committees and local elections too. They're all so important. They are important. Um, so look out for those. Um, I have a question in chat from Shamika. And she asks, how do we frame the conversations we've been having as a coalition so that our legislators um, will actually hear and receive it? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let you start with that. Oh, well, Senator Chang Diaz. guess here you know of course I'm, I'm i'm one of 200 legislators so i i will express a little humility about what i you know how much i know about what's going on in my colleagues heads but i you know my my sort of general vibe is that i think that most of my colleagues are not aware yet of this shift in framing about you know and, and about the the deep coalition work um that i think i probably see only a tiny fraction of it right um that the deep coalition work that that JDI is doing, right, and that it, it really is such a um, a service to us, you know, as um, as representatives of a lot of people, right? Like it's hard to get, you know, so many opinions and to synthesize and boil down and boil down and you know without oversimplifying. Um, and I'm not sure that most legislators know um about that coalition work that you've been deeply involved in and and the reframing that i think it has pulled you know my perception is that it has pulled you towards and so just you know just you know how they say you know sort of showing up is half the battle right like doing that educate that next step of education work of right sort of what you've been you know you've been sort of coalition facing because it takes work and time um to turn around you know and bring that work to legislators and unpack it for them, right? Of this is how we used to talk about and how we think, you know, you may think about um, survivors. Um, let me tell you, you know, the, the growth process we've been going through um, and why we are, you know, intentionally choosing to talk about and think about this work in a different way. And um, that education work takes time, but I think there is a real payoff um, from it. So I know that's not a very sexy answer, um, but um, also, <laughs> I, you know, as again, as a former educator, I always say legislators um, or policymakers, right, even in the executive branch, policymakers need a do now, right? This is what we used to do for students. You put it up on the chalkboard so that when they come in uh, to the classroom, you know, there's not disorder or chaos, right? Like they come in, they look at the board, they know exactly what to do. Open your book to page 62 and, you know, answer questions one, two, three. Uh, and um, legislators have, uh, you know, a lot coming at them. Every issue, you know, we're expected to be, you know, um, experts and have opinions and answers on every issue under the sun, um, from you know public safety to environmental policy to you know um, sometimes international policy, right? Um, to education, you name it. And so, being able to say, look, um, trust, like we, you you view us as experts and allies. Here's what we need you to do. We need you to use these words, and we need to vote for this amendment. Sometimes you just, you know, when the chips are down. We just need some marching orders. Yeah, that's real talk. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, we don't need sexy, but we do need Hema Sarang Semensky, who is our yeah. director of public policy, who does a fantastic job of putting all of our thoughts and, and desires and advocacy um, into something that is readable uh, and understandable. Uh, and so we appreciate her. Uh, Deborah, your response to that question. Well, I. I appreciate that, and I just want to—I want to do a, a, a huge thank you to the JDI team, many of whom are here today. Not everyone. Just the amount of work, and we're small. We're eight-person staff, uh, and we have sixty-two member programs in our coalitions across the state. So that's a lot of different voices, and being in coalition also means finding 
uh, common ground, not always the same ground, but common ground. And that's kind of uh, what I see as the exciting work of building sometimes unity or building conversations across the state um, and the work that we do you know, every day. We have many conversations with legislators and their incredible staff, um, often the way that we, you know, make those relationships work and with our members, because having 62 organizations across the Commonwealth means that they are the experts on what is happening locally. And so when we can do that local and statewide connector, um, it really, really makes a difference. And I think, uh, you know, in having this awesome policy team that we have, both Hema and Nithya, who's our policy manager, who are here with us today, about the framing of the issues has been a real important process for how we can look at talking to elected officials in their communities um, about what resonates for them and what we're hearing that is going on and making a meaningful connection um, on so many different issues. And sometimes, someone might be surprised at the position we have um, or might not be aware of what our framing is or the questions that we look at to determine what is responsive policy. And you know, I, I wanna bring us back even to the issue of reproductive health and reproductive equity because we're having a great event next week and I know someone's gonna put something in the chat about that, um, which is about bridging the anti-violence movement and reproductive equity so that we can think about what the larger impact is of where we're at right now, not, not just here in Massachusetts, but beyond, and really think about how survivors of sexual and domestic violence are impacted by the pulling back or the lack of access in the debates and centering their experiences because we know that reproductive equity is much bigger than abortion. And so this is really, it is, not, it is not about each individual woman and her body. This is about a system, a systemic structural component and who will be impacted the most, you know, are black and brown communities primarily, you know, but many other people with disabilities, others where access is a, a huge barrier. And so, it is wonderful what we've done so far, but we cannot just stop there, I guess, you know, and just say, we've done this. That's where I think advocates and activists or activist advocates, um, all of us who are here tonight have to keep pushing the envelope. Wonderful. Thank you for uh, coming back to that subject matter around reproductive equity, reproductive justice, and how that is not just about a woman in her body, but a very system that is set up um, uh, that is not conducive to the health and, and well-being of uh, certain communities, definitely our survivors of, of domestic and, and sexual violence, um, but also our trans community, right? And how we are talking about that in terms of gender and Inclusion. not leaving people out, right? Yes. And, and uh, definitely brown and black communities and how we say access. It, we really are talking about transforming society. And, and yes. while it's larger that, that for me as always, you know, as I think about priorities to me, people need a place to live. Like people need a place. It seems very simple in, in a country uh, where we have plenty. We have plenty of food. Thank you, Jim McGovern. I mean, you yes, my representative. Thank you. Let's end hunger. We could have ended hunger uh, a long time ago because we have food, right? Um, and, and we have places for people to live. We have enough space. Um, uh, okay. But those are really, uh, it, this is just real talk. Those are really things that then um, uh, upset a system that's put in place to benefit very few. And we're seeing that yes. more and more and definitely doesn't take into account uh, communities I'm a member of, but also our survivors. Um, and, and we see that constantly as, as we run out of space in an emergency shelter, people aren't meant to be an emergency shelter for a year and a half. It's emergency shelter. So when I started this work, maybe 90 days and we were able to uh, help folks uh, go into safer housing. Uh, now we, we have people in an emergency shelter for a year and a half to two years. Uh, and, and for our immigrant uh, 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 survivors, it's even longer. There's just nothing. 
there's uh, it's it's yep. so that even advocates become really and have become disillusioned um um but we um, and continue to do the work. Um, so I see that um, somebody did drop in chat. If you're interested in that wonderful conversation, I know JDI is um, uh, sponsoring around reproductive equity to be sure to register for that. And while it's real talk, I don't ever really want to end on a, a downer. <laughs> so I, I want to um, uh, talk a little bit about or, or have you all say a word or two about what keeps you hopeful in this work that we do every day, day in, day out, um, as we continue to, um, I want to say, advocate uh, in, in a vociferous way for uh, those who aren't able to do it um, and, and also provide space for those who are, um, knowing when to step back and when to step forward. Um, but I will start with, you know, Senator Chang Diaz, I'm going to let you have the last word on the hope. Deborah. What keeps you hopeful day in and day out? I know you've been doing this work for a long, long time. Um, I think it's important to not, I'm not hopeful every single day or every moment of the day, right? But overall, I believe in justice and change. And I am inspired by so many leaders and activists who are have been doing this work for a long time and who are emerging and uh, uh, you know and hearing their perspectives and we should never be stagnant we our perspectives always have to be evolving because there's always something to learn and grow from and that actually um keeps me hopeful being in a community of 62 you know organizations and a staff that is phenomenal is also both inspiring and gives me hope for change so you know i think we have to remind ourselves about the things that are both in our personal lives, but also in our bigger community lives, that there is that synergy that comes from making good trouble together. And that is what keeps me hopeful. Thank you, Deborah. Senator Chang Diaz. Um, first of all, I'll co-sign on that, right? Just the people that you're in the trenches with. Um, sometimes that's really what gets you through. Um, I think it is, a, there are, I, I'm gonna work my way around to an answer to your core question because there are things that keep me hopeful and I, I do ultimately still feel hopeful about this work, but I think it is important um, to acknowledge, right? The, like, the moments of despair that we work through uh, because I think it's dangerous when we start to feel like, am I the only one who feels this way <laughs> or who sees this, you mm -hmm. know, and how hard it is. And, um, you know, knowing that we have, you know, sisters and brothers in those moments of struggle um, and tapping into what helps them, you know, stay um, is really important. So I'm going to say there really are moments, like, look, I've, you, got, you all know I've been a very, through a very difficult year and a half, right? And it didn't come out the way that I wanted. Um, but I still, you know, after 14 years of running at a sprint and being tired as all hell, <laughs> um, I still believe in this work. And I want to, I'll give you a specific story that's just sort of been on my mind and my heart as we've been talking about this, of, a, of, of something that was both a low moment um, and something that I, in retrospect, look back on, you know, in its totality as a, as a hopeful moment. I remember in 2020, uh, when we were having the debate in the Senate on the police accountability law um, that we, you know, uh, crafted over the course of maybe six weeks or so after the, you know, after the uh, murder of George Floyd came to light and the Black Lives Matter uh, street protests, uh, you know, really raw moment for us as a country and a commonwealth. And um, that was a bill that I helped co-write. I'm proud as hell of it. It was a really good bill. It was a strong bill. There was a lot of heartache in it because also it did not, you know, I've learned over 14 years, even in my best moments of triumph in the, in the legislature, that you never get a clean win, right? Where you just feel like victory. There's always something that's missing. You never get 100%. And you have to sort of learn to see the, the progress, even in those moments of like, God damn it, you know, like, why couldn't we get this thing that should have been so sensible? And we are a democratic supermajority legislature, like we should have been, we should be able to get qualified immunity, right? Uh, reform, and we couldn't. But in the way, late, late hours of that debate, you know, we had just spent many, many hours, you know, telling just gut-wrenching stories of injustice that have happened, you know, obviously across the country, but also right here in Massachusetts. 
and you know stories of systemic violence and racism and the need for reform and what the, it was you know probably three o'clock in the morning right we've been through it all and one of my democratic colleagues from a heavily you know uh, bipoc district um uh, got up on the floor and i remember it was actually over the phone because this was during the pandemic and i remember hearing his voice piped in and it was the last you know amendment of the night and it was about something about i think like a uh, victim uh, notification for parole board hearings or something like that. And, you know, very righteous floor remarks about, you know, being here fighting for victims. And he, in he introduced his remarks by saying, we've spent this whole debate talking about uh, uh, those who commit crimes. I think it's about time we start talking about victims. And it, I almost, you know, my head almost exploded, frankly, with rage, um, because what he meant, you know, and he was not even embarrassed to say it out loud, right? What he meant, and I don't think he even under realized in the moment sort of how hurtful this was. What he meant was all those, you know, black and brown people who have been victims of police violence and brutality that you've spent the last several hours talking about, he still thought of them as crime perpetrators, you know, people that the police come to get. And so they must be criminals. And the people that I think about as victims are the only victims. And it was a really just, it was a really hard moment. Um, but when I look back on it in retrospect, you know, that's a sign of a lot of along the ways that we have to go in hearts and minds. But we still won that bill, you know, and even though it doesn't have qualified immunity reform in it, it is by a long shot, the strongest damn bill, you know, police accountability law in the 50 states. And you know, just the other day, there's a the article in the paper about the um, the officer in the Woburn Police Department, uh, you know, who resigned and who's you know being investigated for involvement in the Charlottesville uh, white supremacist you know demonstrations and um, violence. And you know, he's under investigation still. But if that officer is decertified by our new statewide police, peace officer standards and training board he will no longer be able to serve in any police department in Massachusetts. Not just, you know, don't just get fired in one and go over to the one next door. That's a real change in the lives of millions of people in Massachusetts who can start to have, you know, we have a long road to go, but who can start to have a more trusting relationship with law enforcement and the criminal legal system. And so, you know, hope challenging moment, but we went, my, my, my sort of all in here is that even in, you know, when I count all the heartbreaks over the years, you don't win every fight, but we win enough to make it worthwhile being in the ring. And that's still how I feel about this work. And that is the bottom line that still gives me hope. Whew. Well, thank you. I'm glad we have you uh, in the state house uh, fighting and reminds me of what I always use when I get to this uh, uh, place maybe of, is anything really changing? And remembering Derek Bell, who said the victory is in the struggle. Sometimes that's just the answer. That's the answer. Like you continue to do the work because you know it's the right thing to do, right? It's what your conscience tells you to do. It is we will continue uh, uh, to fight. I mean, that's just, um, it's never an option, even if I think about it for a minute of giving up. Even if it's a day, like you have to do something. Mm -hmm. What do you have to do? You know, you do something. And so, you know, what gives me hope is really everybody, uh, my fellow board members who have joined us um, this evening, uh, definitely uh, you, Senator uh, Chang Diaz, and of course, Deborah, as I said, our visionary leader at uh, uh, JDI, um, gives me hope all the time. And when I have to reach out and just uh, touch someone, <laughs> it's like, Deborah. <laughs> But tell me, tell me again, tell me why, tell me why, but uh, definitely Anytime. You know, all very inspirational to me and, and the people who do the work um, every day and come back. As I said, my fellow board members, as we engage in another strategic plan um, session, um, just wanting to make sure we're on course, right? And showing up when we need to show up. That's the biggest thing. Um, so any last comments from any, I know we covered quite a bit and I can't believe we're, we're you know, uh, coming to the end here because this conversation is so um, um, great um, and interesting, but anything else, Senator Chang Diaz that you want to leave us with today, uh, and then Deborah, if you have anything you'd like to say, I, I'm going to turn it over to our chair. Send money to JDI. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> 
reach out, like us on, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Wonderful. And let's, Thank you. let's keep having a real talk, right? Keep having real talk. A lot, lot to talk about. I, I want to also thank all the folks who attended tonight. Absolutely. We're not quite done yet, so don't leave us. <laughs> we're not. We're not leaving yet. Um, hold on, because I have uh, someone again who inspires uh, a great deal of hope um, for me. Um, is our chair of development, Celia Ricca, who will come to you with a, a message. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you for leaving us on that hopeful note. I will spend any evening with the three of you, so thank you for coming into my home, um, and thank you all for being with us tonight. Tonight was really made possible by our current donors and our supporters, and can't leave you without the ask to join us in community and to invest in JDI. You heard so much tonight about the small but very mighty team that leads the statewide coalition. And we need that investment in our work so we can sustain it. You know, the work is not stopping as you heard tonight, it's getting harder and, but we're up to the task. So I do invite you to get in touch with us, whether it's through making a one-time donation, something sustained and annual, or by joining the grand circle of giving. Um, those champions really made tonight in this Real Talk series possible. And like Debbie said, we want more, we need more Real Talk. And of course, we appreciate that folks can uplift the work in many ways. Um, I know Tony and others dropped in the chat the social media handles. So follow, share, bring people into the work. Every one of us can do a little piece of that. So thank you. Thank you again to all of you. And um, I hope you'll join us. And Debbie, I'll toss it back to you or one of our fearless leaders. Thank you. Thank you, Celia. Again, just reemphasizing, we have a number of things in chat. We have a conversation regarding reproductive equity. Please register for that. Um, uh, you know, a light lift is liking us on social media, sharing us uh, and the information and the work we do with your friends. So please do that. Uh, feel free to donate as Senator Chang Diaz, uh, um, her last words, uh, donate to JDI. I agree with that, jo donate to JDI. Uh, become part of our grand circle of giving um, and find out what that's about. But please feel free to reach out to us if you're interested. We look forward to bringing you another Real Talk real soon. Um, so thank you all for coming, for joining us, for supporting us in this Real Talk. Talk about us a lot. Um, and, and let people know they should support JDI. We definitely believe in the organization that's doing some transformational work. So thank you for joining us uh, and everyone have a good evening. <laughs>